Steve Price. Oh, yes, a frothy one. <laughs> Welcome to Super Between Two Beers. How are you, mate? <laughs> yeah, very good. We're excited to have you in the Export Beer Garden studio today. Uh, Shay is very excited for this episode. Might have to rein the big guy in a little bit, eh, Shay? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been frothing all morning, be honest with you. Like, uh, I got into the Winner's Bible, a book, a few years ago, and it talked about kind of improvements you can make to your life. And they spoke about if there's people that you know that are inspirational, you want to aspire to be like, have imagery of them around. So as a man in his late 20s, early 30s, you were a photo up on my wall. Oh, wow. Um, as someone that I aspired to be from what I'd seen. So to have you in here today is, is pretty amazing for me. Oh. I also stalked you a little bit on the netball courts uh, here in Auckland. My right. niece, uh, Eddie Tiana, played uh, with Jamie Lee yeah. um, through the years. And I had a copy of your book that I always wanted you to sign, but I was always too shy oh, to come up and ask. Yeah. So I've actually, I've got actually it brought it oh, here man. today. Sweet ass. So after this, yep. I'd love you to sign this book for me. So yeah, my pleasure. I've got Stephen Price anecdotes and notes in my head from woe to go, but yeah, like Stevie said, he will rein me in because I'm already babbling and uh, right. and fanboying hard out here. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get a lot of uh, 40 year old men coming up to you and sort of uh, <laughs> can't control themselves? Oh, we're, certainly the age uh, has changed over time. And there's no younger ones now. They just walk past you. And it's uh, more my age that, that come up and say good day, which is really cool. Yeah. No matter where you are, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. You're in New Zealand. Uh, this is the last stop on a three-day sort of media tour to uh, promote Celebrity Treasure Island. Yeah. How's it been being back in the spotlight? Which also is one of my favourite shows too. Yeah. <laughs> fan, regular listeners will know I'm a big reality <laughs> TV fan. So like, I'm all coming up Millhouse today. It's yeah, great. Yeah, that's good. No, it was great to, to be flying back into New Zealand. There's so many great memories here in the country and and then to catch up with the people that you know I spent some time with in a beautiful place that I hadn't been to much when my when I was living here so down in Wanaka um, what a beautiful place and um, yeah I didn't know the people before the show and to get to meet them and and play a part in the show with with them was really really cool and learn learn a lot about them and you know some really great opportunities Tamiiti lying under the under the stars just chewing his ear off listening to all of his stories of his life and yeah it was awesome yeah can't wait to get it. i can't wait to rip into that it's so good <laughs> awesome, mate. um so part of our process is uh we reach out to your friends and family and anyone that we can think of to help uncover some good yarns uh, which sort of help paint a picture of steve price perhaps public hasn't seen um three of your family members sent the same story Ooh. so I was, I was hoping you could uh this is indulge a us. scary <laughs> it's a piggyback incident with casey Ooh, and yes. it was a, a number of years ago but yes. uh quite an interesting anecdote yes so <clears throat> my mother-in-law was down um at the time and i remember taking the kids to bed and so instead of just you know walking the kids into the bedroom the kids go oh can we have a piggyback dad and say, so, yep, yeah, righto, jump on. So I think Casey was first, Jamie was second, and then Riley was last. And Casey's quite like skinny bony, and she's just wrapped around my throat. And I'm walking past saying goodnight to the mother-in-law and the wife, and then next thing just passed out. <laughs> she put the sleep hold on me, and we've all just hit the floor. And I was actually like out for about five or ten seconds, and I've woken up. And... <laughs> My wife is standing over me laughing at it. <laughs> my mother-in-law, I'm worried about the kids. They're all right. They're laughing. So, yeah, I've been taken out by my, what, what she would, she would have been probably five at the time. Is, is that where the voice went back in, <laughs> back, back in, the, back in those days? Could have been. Obviously, <clears throat> no oxygen to the brain, mate. <laughs> I was gone. So, yeah, maybe a, a few other opposition teams should have taken up my uh, my daughter's that, technique of how to how to dominate me. That would be quite a scary sight, big unit like you yeah. just going down, like <laughs> just face first. Holy shit! Yeah, yeah. Was, we, yeah, I hit the uh, hit the floor. That we had a, a timber floor, so it was a fair noise. And um, yeah, don't remember any of it to be honest. Wow. Before Stevie jumps into the next one, Casey did want me to ask: Have you got a favourite child? <laughs> No, I love my children all <laughs> equally. It's, it's a, the one constant because she's always into me because obviously Jamo plays netball and Riley's playing league and she's sort of like, oh, I'm the I'm the weird, the misfit, you know. Obviously, they're the favourites. And I said, no, sweetie, you, you're you're all my equal favourites. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, well played. Um, so the other one that, that uh, popped up from, from multiple was um, 
a few times apparently there was a family game of touch and there was one game in particular, boys versus girls at Marist <laughs> High School Fields. I love a guest reaction when they know the story <laughs> and they're going, oh, I'm going to And I've got Casey's version, but I'd love to hear uh, uh, your retelling of it. So, yep, just family. So myself, my wife, Joe, Jamie, Casey, Riley. Um, I think it was me and Riley against Joe, Casey and Jamie. And, yep, just a general game of touch. Good game, you know. Anyway, my wife has made a break down the wing and she starts commentating that she's away and she's going to score. And I go, oh, <laughs> is she just? So, I don't know. There, there used to be a Foxtel ad. I don't know if you ever saw it, but there was this old lady running along and then this guy just comes across and <laughs> levels up. <laughs> I actually did that. Yeah, like, wow. I said, no, you're not. And so I raced across. It was probably one of the best cover tackles I've ever done. <laughs> She dropped it and she's got up. On, she's got almost double jointed knees. Brent always hated it because he had four knee recons. He goes, if I had, <laughs> if I had Joey's knees, I would have never had a knee injury. But it is almost wrapped around me and her and everything. And I thought, oh no, she's done her ACL. And she's got up saying, you effing idiot, what were you doing? This is, and just got up, got the football, threw it at me, and then just started walking home. Come on, we're going home. Your father's just ruined this game. <laughs> What's your reaction at that point? Like, I know when, when you're playing with kids and you go a little bit, as an adult, you go a little bit too far, rough and tumble. When it's your wife, yeah. like, are you tail between legs kind of skulking back home a little bit later on? Oh, well, I, I was sort of uh, confused. I'm going, like, it's a game. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, like, you sort of were... Big note in yourself. Amazing. Like, amazing. Don't carry on like you're going to score. And yeah, I'm away. And she thought she was Ray Warren. Like, doing it wrong. <laughs> oh, so good. Yes, Joe Price is up the sideline. Steve Price can't catch her. It's all gone. I'm over. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> no, you're not, Dallas. Um, so Casey's retelling of it was, um, she said, you came out in your sort of Aussie socks pulled. It was like, yeah, a <laughs> family game of touch. Full noise. And you've come up, your Aussie socks pulled up, and they're like, right, he looks like he means business. <laughs> and he said, there's another one, like you put this big bomb up. And I kicked off. Was, uh, I kicked off, and Jamo's quite, she's quite similar, very... Riley's underneath it, and he's tiny, Riley. And Jamie's just absolutely come through and in the air caught it and knocked Riley out. Like, actually knocked him out. Oh. And Joey's like, up me. I said, mate, I only put the kick up. Like, what about Jamie's the one who knocked Riley out? And <laughs> Riley gets up after that and he's okay. He probably should have went off for a HIA. <laughs> 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 they, weren't, they weren't the thing back then. But um, The same game. Same that, game. That's that, the, and that's, that was, sorry, that's the opening act of the that game? That was before, yeah. Oh, mate, amazing. Yeah, that amazing. was before. So, I think the girls scored and we kicked off. Yeah. And that was the kickoff. Um Jamo's just wiped Rolls, eh? Um, and then, yeah, I finished the game by taking out Joey. Amazing. She didn't talk to me all the way home. It's We, we used to live in Taylor's Road. So it's only up the road. And, yeah, she was off, gone. I had to pick up the footy and the kids are gone with her. They're like little ducks behind mum. And I'm by myself. Um, full kit as well. Full kit. <laughs> <laughs> so like, good. Like, luckily, I was close enough to be able to get inside before she locked the door. I reckon she would have locked me out. Question for you two, is there, and probably more, more prominent for you with, with adult kids, is there a point where you stop with the physical challenges against your kids because they've outlasted you? They're, they're faster than you now. Like, even as a retired athlete, Stephen, with all due respect, you're still in the – your kids are still coming up and you were a – a good regional athlete, but as a former pro athlete, is there a point where you go, oh, look, we're done with the running races, we're done with the bench press comps? It's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Jamie, uh, that happened in Auckland. She was at the uh, Magic and she'd have these this training stuff that she'd have to do. So uh, I'd retired and I'd put my hand up to, you know, yeah, let's go, Jamie, we'll do it, you know. Um, anyway, so I'd go and I'd, I was beating her all, of, all the time and then there was this one time where we did it and... I didn't beat her. And then I've just gone, that's it. You do it now. And then I just started just doing the watch. <laughs> Whereas before yeah, I was yeah. actually running with her. And that's the time when I've gone, oh, okay. I couldn't keep up with her. Yeah. Um, which was great. Yeah. For her, good confidence for her. And yeah, demoralizing for me. Yeah. But um, Rosie, um, Jamie would always be the dominant one in the family with the kids and always picking on Rose, being the youngest. And then one day he took her on and, um, yeah, he she didn't beat him. Yeah, right. And so that stopped between those two. 
but between him and me, he's always young buck. Come on, Dad. You know, and I learned a few tricks in my time. So I've still got a few more up my sleeve, so I'm still getting him. But he's 22 now and he's doing pre-season every year and yeah. all the wrestling techniques. And so he taps out most times. But, um, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a day not too far away where I'm not going to not going to be able to control him. And it's such a different perspective on roughhousing, like a dad with his son as well, when you've got a former rugby league player and a current rugby league player going at it in the lounge floor. Imagine that's some, there's some sights there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we don't do it in the house. <laughs> yeah, not allowed. Not allowed. Joey said no. <laughs> no. Yeah, we're both scared of her. <laughs> <laughs> so those yarns are great because from the outside, it seems like you've cracked the code with family. Um, you met your wife when you were teenagers. You've been together since. You've raised three amazing kids. It's Jamie's a world champion netballer, Riley professional rugby league player, and Casey, as we mentioned, affecting lives as a nurse. But most importantly, it seems like there's just so much love and respect there for each other. And I've got a young family and would love them to have the bond that you share with your kids now, sort of later in life. So I guess the question is, what advice do you have for dads or parents to create the, the bonds and the love that you have? Yeah, I, I suppose... Um we, we had Jamie very young, oh, well, not very young, we were 21, which we weren't expecting to, but it's been the greatest thing that's happened to us because we were quite young and we had no idea how to be a parent and we've learnt each time. We've hopefully got better as we went through. Poor old, poor old Jamo um, had us at our rawest and then by the time Riley arrived, he had support with Jamie but also um, us. And I suppose we both grew up in... Um, um, our parents both got divorced and I think one of our goals was to marry someone that was, uh, you hope, is forever. But we're really good. We're good. We're great mates, first and foremost. And and I think the biggest thing to do is just be genuine. Um, and you can't say something and not do it. So, you know, whenever we do stuff and say stuff and whatever, we've got to be able to back that up. And I think they're your best examples for your kids. You can't protect them from the badder elements of society. So there was times where Jamie would want to go to a party and she was quite young and instead of saying no, we'd go, no, you get, absolutely, that's fine. Um, if there's any issues, like, give us a ring. And to her credit, one of the first times that she did go, it was over here in New Zealand, she went and it wasn't a real good situation. And she know, she obviously was aware of that. And she rung us sort of straight away and she actually brought three or four of her mates home with her really? to take them out of the situation too. And I, I said to Joe that night, I said, How, this is amazing. This is what you, you pray your kids are going to do, you know. And they're, they're not perfect. They're going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think that's one of the biggest things. They've obviously, from a professional sporting perspective, have seen the goods and the bads as well through my career. So... Um, and also their uncles um, with Brent. Um, there's nothing that they wouldn't have seen. Um, so they're fully aware of what they were getting into. And um, you just hope your kids do what they, they, they're they passionate about and they get really excited about doing. So, And the three of them are doing that, which is great. And they're with really nice people. You know, they're beautiful people that they've actually connected with in the way they're partners and, and who they hang around. Um, so that makes you really proud. I saw some internet video um, a week ago that stuck with me and it was someone talking about what success means and it's not all the money in the world and it's not all the achievements, it's your kids wanting to hang out with you when you're older. And yeah, right. I, I thought about you because in, in talking to you, all of your kids, yeah. like the, the way they speak about you is, is, yeah, it's just so great. Yeah, well, Jamie has brought it up actually at Christmas this year. So between Christmas and New Year's, she's taken it upon herself. She's going, we're going somewhere together because they've got partners and stuff, so they do, you know. So actual Christmas and New Year's, we may not be together, but she said, I don't care. We're locking this away for this period. And we're going up to 1770, uh, which is a beautiful place just um, up around Gladstone there in Queensland on the coast. So we're going up there for three or four days with their partners and Joe and I, and it'll be awesome. And JMO's really pushed that. So that's, mate, that's great. Like, rather than us being the ones who are always come on, you know, come up. And, and Jamo's, whenever she gets a chance, she always wants to fly up in case, 
Um, she's on the sunny coast. Uh, she's just finished building their house, her and Tice. And then Rolls is in Townsville, so he's on his way to, to Sydney. But um, yeah, he comes down when he can, when he's when he can. And um, I, I just really enjoy the conversations that we have. And Joe speaks to him a lot every day. I don't speak to him as much just because I'm away working, which you know I'm disappointed with. But I think you look back at your own life. And my mum and dad split when I was younger. So did Joe's mum and dad. Um, I was brought up by mum and my stepfather. I uh, didn't have a lot to do with dad. And I suppose all the things that I felt as though I missed out on, I, I want to make sure that my son doesn't and my daughters don't. Um, and that's being around for their big moments and, you know, um, feeling as though they can ring you any time and talk to you about anything, no matter what it is, mm-hmm. rather than hiding stuff. And, you know, um, I don't profound that I'm going to have all the answers but if you're aware of it then you can either help them in doing it or find a way to find someone that can help them or teach them about understanding how they can help themselves or avoid things you know. From the outside like I said and and what you've just spoken about is so much happiness and and warmth and love but there's also been dark times and there's been some some difficult times lately if you're open to it would you be able to talk to us about what what happened with your dad recently yeah so uh february 11 20 what are we 23 22 2022 i got a phone call from my uh, half sister to say that dad had passed which was a huge shock and then found that he um committed suicide so Dad was someone that I didn't have a lot to do with when I was younger, but would sort of be there every now and then. Um, it was almost so I could avoid paying maintenance to mum, but mum wasn't worried about that. But back then, the government would f- find him and pretty much make them make payments. And so he'd just go underground, basically. And as soon as we'd find where we were, it was just more to say day. And he sort of felt as though he just had to spend money on us all the time to make up. But I just wanted to spend time with him, you know. So... Over the time as we got older, you know, I talked to him a lot more um, and, yeah, it was really cool. And then towards the end, there was moments where he'd just sort of say, Stevie, I'm tired, I'm worn out, I'm, you know, I'm done sort of thing. Um, And he'd said that a lot through his life. Um, So I didn't really see it as as what ended up happening. But now now I look back on it, I sort of thought, well, maybe – I should have said or done something more, but, you know, talking to people in that situation, you're always going to have unanswered questions and you can't wrap yourself up in anxiety and that about what you could have done because at the end of the day, it's done and it's and that's the saddest thing about that situation. It's forever. So it um, leaves a lot of people behind that, that, um, that miss that person. Like I, I, it was his birthday the other day. Uh, you'd get a random call or I'd ring him and he was very unique dad very different to me and and that type of thing but you'd really look forward to it so uh, I just disappointed I suppose for the kids their grandfather's not going to see their kids or you know and and that type of thing um, and he would have loved that but yeah it is what it is um, it I was on the show uh, on the first anniversary so I didn't really know how to how to handle it um and yeah a lot of the guys on the show were really were amazing um spoke about it around the campfire one night and yeah sort of opened up a lot of people to talk about different things in their life as well which um yeah put things in in perspective and really helped so i didn't really know um how i should have felt that was the hardest thing um so in a weird way, it's amazing that you were able to share that experience with some people who have maybe have some tools in their tool set through the show to be able to kind of help you around yeah. that period. Well, and then to actually understand that there's some people that are, had a bit worse off experiences, you know, like was, uh, and I didn't say anything on the day because I, I didn't want, I don't know, I just didn't want people to feel sorry for me or anything like that. So you're trying to be this big, tough person, but people could tell like there was something something wrong and they and they kept asking me are you all right and i go yeah yeah, yeah no i'm all good um but then it, yeah it was that night where i just sort of said i'm really sorry there's nothing going on here because i you're in a game and you, you don't mm. want people to feel as though that there's any um under, underlying, like that, right? yeah, underlying issue They're taking the rice and not not ask, <laughs> not, uh, not <laughs> ask, not ask permission for it or that. there you go so yeah that was one of the 
the things that I was, I wanted to be really open in the show and just be myself. So it took me all day to build the courage up to do that. And then when I did it, um, yeah, it was incredible how then the conversation. And I think if anything, it taught me um, that by talking to people that I suppose you can trust, the the actual benefit you get from it is unknown and so huge. Like it was so soothing. I wish I had spoken about it earlier that day because yeah. I would have had a lot better day. Yeah. Like I, I didn't have a great day in regard to – it wasn't a terrible day but it could have been a better day and it was my, my fault because I was too scared of talking about stuff, you know. Have, have you taken that out of the show and, and, and implemented 100%. that in, into your everyday life now? 100%. Yeah, yeah wow. absolutely. So – yeah, things like that were really good. And, you know, that, that was the thing I was saying about talking to a guy like Tummy, like so wise and so passionate about what he believed in and, you know, I had to work so hard to get other people to start to understand why he was doing certain things, even if they didn't feel at the time it was the right thing or saw him as a danger or saw him as an enemy. He, he just stuck with it and believed in it and, you know, it's, yeah... Anyway, that that was um, yeah, that was probably my biggest concern going into the game because I knew that it was it was that time period, yeah. and I was yeah. wondering, no matter where I was, how is that going? How when when it happened, I go right in twelve months' time, what what is going to happen on this day? How am I going to feel? I, I've got that exact same thing. Similar time of year is where my father passed away, February seventeenth. Yeah, I know it's it's imprinted into my head. Yeah. And it is like that. When it's coming up to that date, you clam up and you're thinking, shit, how am I going to feel about this? What's going to be dredged up? What's going to trigger me? Yeah. And it's a, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? An experience to kind of go through knowing that there's going to be grief there and you're going to have to deal with it. Yeah. One <clears throat> one of the, the great things, I suppose, when I was here, when we had Sonny Fye, who, um, you know, he drowned and it was terrible. I got on really, really good with Sonny. And so um, I then decided to get a tattoo um, you know, in honour of Sonny. And my wife sort of said, so someone special means so much to you in your life, you're going to get a tattoo every time they pass. And I go, well, no, no. And she goes, well, why are you just going to get one tattoo? Why don't you get a tattoo that represents whatever it is that you're trying to represent? And I said, oh, okay. So I was good mates with Tiki Tane. And so, you know, I was... I rang up Tiki and probably the best person to ring up about tattoos because <laughs> yeah, yeah. he has yeah, got a He's lot. got a couple. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a lot. And, um, yeah, so I rang Tix and I sort of said, you know, I want to get this tattoo to signify that. And so his, his cousin or his bro, uh, Inia Taylor, and Inia is – like he did Once for Warriors, all the tattooing on that. And and um, he's done Case Muse and a few famous New Zealanders. I, I went to him um, and it was out – sort of towards Bethel's way where Sonny drowned and um, the tattoo I got, it sort of goes from here to here. It's like a sleeve. It's got a whole lot of stuff that's my story because it's sort of like a mouldy sort of Pacifica type sleeve and I didn't want to come across as being a plastic just turning up yeah. here and, oh, he's an Aussie trying to carry on and be like us. Yeah. I sort of said to Inia about that and Inia said, mate, it's like Chinese. You don't have to be Chinese to eat Chinese. You know, and it's your story. And as long as you know what all the things mean to you, that's what's most important. And I go, sweet. That's a great way to ex explain it. So it took 24 hours to, to do this tattoo. And the last bit was tap tap. He did the old style. So it's got, you know, indigenous in it for obviously where I'm from, Australia. Um, my heritage is Celtic. So it's um, English, Scottish and Welsh. Um, so it's a lot of those patterns in there, um, as well as Pacifica, like um, Māori, Tongan, Samoan, um, Fijian, because of the people that I played with or had a lot to do with. Um, and yeah, it's got a turtle that, in the middle of that that represents my spiritual side. So he chose the turtle because in Pacifica they were saying about, um, you know, man made an agreement with turtle that when someone passed who was important, that um, in return the um, turtles would come and lay their eggs on the beach and then the turtle would take the spirits and free them to the ocean as a, you know, as a, as an interaction. And um, we did the turtle and 
while we were going through that process, it was three weekends of eight hour sessions in a row. And it was before the 2009 season. So I got it done before the season started. Sonny went missing on the 4th, I think, of January. And um, 4th or 5th, 4th, I think, we started training on the 5th. And he's telling me all the stuff as we're going along of all the meanings, you know, the shark teeth, um, about continuous strength. They just keep on coming forward. Um, waves, another one that's continuous strength. All of these things. And then I've got the turtle and it's got two eyes on its shell which is a spiritual eyes overlooking me and my family and friends that are here and it's the people who are no longer here that are very special to me. Um, the four legs are the kudus of my, obviously my grandparents um, who are very important to me and uh, the shell is obviously protection um, and shelter and that type of thing. So we're going through this process every time. You imagine 24 hours of spending time with someone and he's so knowledgeable. Anyway, the tattoo was done on the Sunday night. On the Monday morning early, he rung me and he goes, bro, he goes, they're not going to find Sonny. And I said, how can you say that? And he said, I'm telling you, they're not going to find Sonny. He said, there was a turtle washed up on Muir Eye Beach this morning and he had a photo of it and there was a person lying beside it and it was almost toe to toe, right? So it's a very old turtle, big old turtle that's washed up and, par you know, passed on the beach. He goes, the ocean has given something special from it to the land to say thank you for giving something special from the land to the ocean in Sunny. So he said he'll never be found and he hasn't to be been this day. And the turtle is what he chose as the spiritual side of it. So it's crazy how that happened the next day after the turtle, the tattoo was finished so it's quite crazy I, I sort of I'm not right into a whole lot of stuff but I do believe there's something else and and I am very spiritual in regard to that so it's a really special tattoo to me and it was quite ironic that Sonny was the one who possessed me to do it and all the people who have passed even dad they're, they're a part of that turtle now um, which is cool for me to know. There's, um, thank you firstly for sharing that incredibly personal story. And there's a part of me that's curious about your feeling towards your family. I've heard you speak about it actually before, about the influence that New Zealand had. And then hearing you retell that story and, and the layers to it as well. Did that New Zealand experience really impact you and your feelings towards family? Yeah, 100%. Um, family's so important to me before I come to New Zealand. Like, it's not. That, that wasn't the case but being here over the time that we're here just the interactions that you have with every family going to Marais like all that type of thing just reinforces the connection and the bond and the the tightness and the strength of what family means and brings and even the boys you know training wouldn't be at training because something happened at home like in Australia that that was not acceptable you, you've got a job you got to be at work um and that would be not constant, but you'd, you'd understand and appreciate it. And it just sort of hit home to what is most important in life. And it is the people you come home to every night. That's how I ended up in New Zealand. You know, I'm not saying that I was being done wrong, wrongly done by the Bulldogs, but I thought I'd be there forever. And then I want to saw some other people who were true blue, born and bred Bulldog people who were then um, not given the opportunity of working at the club anymore for not their fault. I've just gone... That could happen to me. And then I realise, wow, who I come home to every day is the most important because they're the forever. Uh, football or sport is for a period of time. These guys are forever. So um, to come to New Zealand, uh, I knew it would be a different experience, but I, did, I knew it wouldn't be completely different. So if we went to the UK, for example, it's quite different. Uh, during the time, this sort of terrorism stuff was happening and I thought... I didn't want to go to England and then get caught over there and not be able to get home. I still love playing in the NRL. I still love playing for Queensland, Australia, and the club were really happy for me to do that. Um, my biggest fear coming to New Zealand was how my wife and kids would feel. And, mate, I've got to say, it was the greatest part of our whole experience is, you know, Jamie was eight, uh, Casey was six, Riley was three. And I think Rosie left when he was 17. Jamo would have been about 20 and Case would have been about 18 or 19. 
It's a huge part of their life and it's really shaped them as the young young people they are today. And they've got such a, a beautiful connection with New Zealand through friends, people and the country. Um, that'll be something they'll have forever. So it's really cool. It's very unique. To, to give a bit of context for the listeners, so you were a huge deal, right? Bulldogs played 222 games, the captain played for, the, you're an Aussie icon. And the decision to come to New Zealand was huge news. Uh, the reasons you've described, but there's also like a Warriors video, I think Shay, Shay said there was, like a, a combination. Some, like, play, like players, that, as, part of their, oh, as part of their recruitment, I think there was twofold. So Mick, Mick Watson was really creative. Yeah. Um, so when they first reached out to me, because I, we had the salary cap situation at the Dogs and I'd agreed to a deal but hadn't actually signed it yet. And then the salary cap thing hit and then we got a new CEO and he was saying, oh, we want to sign you first as captain. And I said, well, we've already agreed to a deal. When he saw the deal, he goes, oh, we can't do that. We can't honour that. So pretty much stayed on what I was on, um, which was cool. And they said, we'll do a two-year deal and then it's two years in your favour. And no one knew that except for us. But a guy who was actually Mick's brother-in-law worked at the club at the time and he knew the contract, so he told Mick and then they just reached out to me out of the blue and said, he just said, would you, would you actually be interested in having a chat? And I said, why not? So we had a chat and it, that actually got me interested. Um, the Warriors were a team that were always tough to play against. Um, I always felt as though that they could be a, a superpower of the comp. Um, I, I went to the Bulldogs and the culture and, They'd been so successful and there was a standard set. If you couldn't attain that, you didn't survive. And I didn't feel that that was the case at the Warriors. They had some success, but it was fleeting. It was up and down. Um, and I thought, how cool would it be at my stage in my career to be able to go to a place and have an impact on what I walked into at the Bulldogs. And when they were talking about Ruben Wiki also, I go, oh, one of the most fiercest competitors, but you hear every guy talk about one of the greatest teammates you could play with. And I thought in New Zealand, Rubes is the king. Um, these young Kiwi kids that are coming through would absolutely love to be playing with Ruben Wiki. I thought that'd be a cool thing to be a part of. And I was sick of getting run around by Stacey Jones too, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> was he one of the four that, that recorded a video? So there was, I think it was um, Monty, might have been Stace, Arwen, might have been Brent Webb. And they honestly spoke about what it would mean to them to play with Steve Price at the Warriors. And I've just, I don't know whether it was the ego that took over, but I've gone, wow, like that's mad. You know, like I've only looked at them as opponents and to actually then tweak that and go, far out, they actually would love to play in a side with me. And like I've always, you know, admired how skillful and talented all the boys were but I'd never actually thought about it like that. So that, that wasn't a reason why I came, but it certainly was, yeah. yeah, there's a piece in a puzzle and that's another piece that starts to make a beautiful picture. And, and you speak to family. I think they brought Joe over for a weekend without anybody knowing as well. Yeah, so I was in origin camp and I just said to Joe, I said, I can't make a decision about going to the Warriors unless I know you are comfortable with going to the place because you've never been in New Zealand. So I said, I'm not going to make the decision. I've been in New Zealand. I know what it's about. I reckon we can have a... A great time um but most importantly if you're not happy happy wife happy life right so it won't be cool if you're not happy and yeah so the, <laughs> the club organized it she stayed at a hotel and um yeah donnie manny organized going to a barbecue and all this doing the big the big sell and i just sort of said to her the only question i'll ask you are, could you live in new zealand and she goes yep i could live in new zealand no problem and so that was it so then I made the I made the call, um, had some come back from Origin Camp, got to the Leagues Club at the Bulldogs. I don't know, they must have heard that I was really contemplating on going. And I spent from seven in the morning till eleven that night at the Leagues Club just talking to the Bulldogs about what they wanted to do to keep me and um I went home that night and I sat down with Joey and I, I spoke to Wayne Bennett about it. He said, Mate, I don't see it being a problem for you. I think it'd be good. Um, I think you'd be great for them and they'd be great for you. Um, and then I don't know what it was, but I just said to Joe, I said, I reckon we should go. You know, and I was, 
it was a big decision for me because I was captain and it was something I dreamt of. And I, I'm a very loyal person, so I was committed to the dogs. I just wanted to be a one-club man. But this was something bigger than just rugby league, in my opinion. And um, made the call. And when I told my manager, he was like, he was like, Whip. mate, <laughs> sorry, are you serious? Because he, he didn't have any, he didn't have any guys at the Warriors. There was um, a manager who had probably most of the of the boys. And he didn't know the owners. He didn't know the management. He was just really unsure about it. And he goes, are you sure? And then I go, yep, 100%. So we met with the Warriors that next morning and told them I was signing. Signed the, signed the contract. and who, who Was it you or was it Joe that put in the fine print that they had to sign Brent Tate in a couple of years' time? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was – that was. Uh, <laughs> For, yeah. for, 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 for unaware listeners, Brent Tate is Joe's brother. Little brother. Who yeah. is your brother-in-law, yeah. obviously. Which the family keeps saying he's the mistake. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, it's a bit, he says he's, to his mum, it's the best mistake you've ever ah, made. Ah, it's a good comeback. So I think he's uh, eight years younger than us. Yeah. Um, so Peter, that's Joe's sister. She's the oldest. She's two years older than us. And then Joe. And then Brenny, he's, he's eight years younger. So I've known Brent since he was three. Um, to see to see him come through and achieve the things he achieved is so humbling and proud, you know, of him. And it almost got to the stage. I was at the Warriors. We played the Broncos in Brisbane, and Brent was playing. And there was a family wedding on out in Roma, and they couldn't beat the game. So I ran at Brent as much as I could, and he used to wear that neck brace. And I did a little rabbit killer and it jarred his neck, and he stayed down. And I didn't <coughs> well. Brent's family didn't talk to me for two and a half weeks. Really? I, got, I got black lined. Really? Yeah, it was it was quite. Yeah. <laughs> and I just said, "Stop being, so stop being a winger, freedom. mate." Like seriously. Okay, you can come play with me in Auckland. So that's fine, mate. He, come over. I said, "Well, that's what I said to him. I said the only way it's going to change is if you, if you're on my team. Otherwise, I'll just keep doing it." Yeah, nice. And um, Warriors, we we're looking for someone like him and experienced. Uh, super competitor. Because um, what was your impressions of the joint when you first arrived? You've played against them. Yeah. You've been at a very successful organisation in the Dogs. Very, and, and then you come into a, a brand new, a bit like us, playing in an away studio today, yeah. a new surrounding, new environment. What were your first impressions or your first takeaways? It was really different to what I thought. Yeah. They they just had success, sort of 2002, grand final, 2003, was pretty good. Two thousand and four, equal oh, last. Wasn't the worst. The worst that they've had was no, the equal, equal last. So yeah. I think South were four and against got the wooden spoon. So I went from the penthouse. We won the comp at the Bulldogs, and I moved to the Warriors. Who was yeah, the doghouse, the, the lowest. So um, yeah, very different to what I actually thought. I thought it'd just be a case of just getting the boys pretty excited. Uh, very talented group. Will be sweet as you know. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. Players being sent to England, and yeah, it was it was quite crazy actually. Um, and I suppose John Hart coming on board, um, Wayne Scarra coming on board. You know, um, Kempy was there, and then Ivan come in. We started to get a bit of consistency and solidarity, and we we're able to then build a a solid squad instead of losing quite talented players, Ali Lawatiti and mm. Louis and Louis um, Anderson and, you know, his brother Vinny and we're sort of losing these Brent Webb, Francis Melly, like some superstars that I really looked forward to come to play with. Even Stace, like he went to Catalans. Um, yeah, but then we're, uh, I've did a great job. Our recruitment did a great job and we're able to, put a bit of a squad together that was really consistent. I'm really keen to get your take on leadership because across 17 years in the NRL, yeah. you were a great leader at the Bulldogs and the Warriors. You helped them rebuild. But I'm sure you also witnessed and experienced some really weak leaders or bad leaders. What is it that makes a good leader and what was your style of leadership? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, I always was a leader when I was in the juniors and then when I got to the Bulldogs, it was almost like the King of England, like you've got to wait your chance and you mightn't get it because... Captain-in-waiting or whatever well, it was. Terry Lamb was yeah. captain for so long and then 
we had Simon Gillies and then Darren Britt and then Darren decided to go to England and which gave me the chance. I really wanted it, but the big thing that Steve Folks had an issue with was my inconsistency. Um, I wasn't consistent, so I can't have a captain who's not consistent. So that'll answer probably your first question is you've got to be consistent. You cannot lead if you aren't performing. You know, so his biggest question mark over me was that. So I had to try and find a way to show him consistency. Uh, I was always a good trainer. I loved trying to lead and push myself and, and that type of thing. Um, so I just continually start to do stuff like that. When I got the situation where I might have been a chance, I went and saw our sports psychologist at the time and I just he just says, right, well, what do you think it's going to take to be to be the captain of the Bulldogs? And so I just went blah, 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 blah. And then he just said, you got all the answers, mate. I don't know why you're here. Mm. So that gave me a bit of confidence. Um, I had to deal with a fair bit. Like, so first game I was captain of the Dogs, we lost to the West Tigers, who we should have won easily. First game of the year. And then the second game we drew against the Broncos. So after two games, we're one of the favourites. My captainship yeah. and we haven't won a game yet, you know. So there's starting to get some question marks asked. And then we went on this 17-game winning streak. And it was a time where I'm not being arrogant or up, up ourselves, but I, I never felt we were going to get beaten, no matter what situation we are in. That's just how we were playing. And the Warriors were the one who beat us over here in Mount Smart. Um, and they did a bit of a job on us, actually. So we were on a real um, – we were steamrolling it. And, yeah, then we come up against the Warriors and they, they taught us a lesson. Um, then the salary cap thing come out uh, a week or so later and we're out of the comp in regards to being able to win the comp. What, uh, what did that teach you about leadership? Yeah, honest, just being honest. So I was sort of thrown in front of the cameras to be the representative because Mace and a few others started having their opinions. which Mace being Willie Mason. Willie Mace, who's yeah. Not, which, short of, not short of them. Well, <laughs> s- speaks and then thinks, you know. <laughs> and at the time, we, we needed to be really consistent and very respectful. Um, we, we had a real chance to, I thought, to really make a, a real um, progressive march in a way that would never have been imaginable. So, yep, put our hands up. We've made a mistake. We're going to, we're committed to continue to play in this competition to the rules that we've been given. We weren't going to play in the semis. Sweet as, you know, Dave, um, that's, that's fine. Uh, David Gallup, who I spoke to a bit. Um, we played Canberra after we got told the decision, which was devastating. We got 39 points taken off us. So you take 39 points off a team, they're going to be negative most of the time. Well, that's how good we were going. Um, we played Canberra first 20 minutes we were down 20 nil come back and I think we lost 32 28 the next week we played Melbourne and absolutely give it to them and then we played our last game at home against Brisbane who if they won that game become minor premiers um, we won and I told Wayne I said we're going to win tonight and he goes no you're not and I said we are the crowd ran onto the field we got chaired around on their shoulders it was as though we won the comp. It was the most, one of the most emotional nights I've been a part of. Uh, of a club like the Bulldogs, we were running really high. You know, everything was going good. Pre-season 2004, there was, um, from Coffs Harbour, there was sexual assault. Allegations made against um, members of the team. And um, again, we felt the best way to approach it was to have uh, minimal voices, be very consistent. So again, it was... Mainly me, not really the CEO or the coach. It was predominantly me. So, again, very different situation. So we're dealing now with sexual assault accusation. I've got two girls. Uh, I've got a son. I've got a wife. Um, I was on the trip. So to come home first and foremost, that were you one of them? There's a question that's asked. And then, you know, not being able to go to schools, which we did a lot of school visits because of the – the height of and totally got it right um so what we decided to do was all sort of be a part of the process investigation to try and get it done as quick as we could because we believed that there was nothing to be um so we all got dna tested and interviewed at the police and quite 
intimidating, very never been in that situation before. It, this thing went on for six months. So we're the front three pages, the back three pages of all papers. Um, and it was a task force put in place. It was huge. So eventually it came out that there wasn't enough ed- evidence. This was a thing that is sort of really hard to cop because it wasn't finalised in regard to saying, no, nah, they're not guilty. Mm-hmm. It was almost insinuating we believe they're guilty. We just didn't have enough evidence to prove it. Yeah. And so every time there's anything to do with a sexual assault accusation or the Bulldogs 2004 get brought up mm-hmm. every single time. So that was quite daunting as a person to have to speak to the public about something that, you know, is massive. Like I know having girls, like if it was my daughters, mate, I'd want to find out what was going on, you know. So that taught me a lot again. And then I signed with the Warriors and I come to the Warriors and I didn't come to the club expecting to be the leader. I just thought Rouge was going to be the man and that was cool and I was okay with that. And then when I got asked to be the captain, I was like, wow, really me? And I thought, okay, well, I've experienced salary cap, I've experienced sexual assault accusations, been a captain for three years on the field. I, I can handle this. And yeah not even a clue to what I was getting into at the Warriors. Very completely different dynamic, very different individuals, very different club, very different environment. And I actually learned so much about leadership under Ivan um, and the players that I played with. They weren't sub leaders because they were huge leaders in their own right. They just didn't have a C on game day beside their name and really learnt to, to re- not to rely, but to, communicate with everyone because to be able to have 30 plus players and have a coverage of 30 plus players making sure that everyone's okay you can't do it yourself and we had a high number of Aussies in the team so it was about 11 in the squad so they'd probably predominantly talk to me some of them wouldn't because we didn't have that personality that's cool but then the Māori, Tongan, Samoan they'd be talking to Rubes or Stace or do you know what I mean? And if one of the boys wasn't quite right, instead of me going and ripping into him and saying, what, what's going on? You're training like a busted. Rubes or someone might come to me and say, oh, you know, Sione this week is there's some stuff going on. Um, he'll be right by the weekend. It's all good. Sweet. Learned so much, mate. So to answer your question, it's, it's been a long answer, <laughs> but I, I totally think there's no hard and fast one way to, to be a leader. I think it depends on where you are, what you're doing, who you're with, um, who you are. I think the best thing that you can do is be very genuine and authentic as an individual because as soon as you try and be someone else, people see through it. Um, So I couldn't be Darren Britt or Simon Gillies or Terry Lamb, you know, because I wasn't those people. Um, I had to be Steve Price and... That was probably one of the biggest things I learned when I come to the Warriors. I made some decisions early in games because I come with an injury. So my first game for the club was against Manly, um, first game of the year. And we got a penalty and I went to take the two and all the boys are blowing up wanting to tap. <laughs> you tap and go, yeah. <laughs> because that's what they did. Yeah, yeah it wasn't And I almost there. said, boys, I watched you last year and the tap and go didn't work. <laughs> yeah. We're taking the two. Right? And we end up losing by two points in that game. But... I think it was really good for me to understand what I was getting into because I didn't have that experience on the field with them mm. um, leading into that game. And then as we went along, I was learning about them and each individual and they were learning about me. And at the Bulldogs, um, I'd been at the club for 10, or 10, 10 years and all those boys that I was in the team with, I saw come through as kids. So I knew how they ticked, everything about them. Braithen Asta, if, if he wasn't having a good day, you wouldn't have a go at him because he just... That, that was his way he'd react back to you and that wasn't good. Whereas Brent Sherwin, if you put a rocket up him, he'd almost reset and he'd be right. Mm. And so those different personalities, it's know how they tick and, you know, at the Warriors it might have been Rubes just having a yarn to Benny Matz or someone like that um, that would work. So, yeah, it, it's it's really interesting that dynamic. It, it can be very, very different depending on where you are. One of the biggest challenges you faced in your leadership at the Warriors was Sunnyfire. Um, yep. 
looking back now, I mean, dealing with loss of a teammate and the trauma that you're going through, you probably didn't really appreciate it at the time. But reflecting back, like, would you do things differently across that year? Yeah, I, I reckon. I reckon we would have, whether it was as a group or individually, we would have done a lot more work on each individual to deal with it, because we're rugby league players, but we're human beings, and I think we just thought we're going to go and do this for Sonny. And we had his number and his signature on our jersey for the year. And we were playing for Sonny and we didn't make the finals that year. And so I was really embarrassed about that because that didn't represent what Sonny meant to us at all. So either you don't say something like that or we need to go about it very differently. Um, and it probably really hit home to me when I watched uh, Manu on um, 60 Minutes at the end of that season. And he was his usual self, the gold teeth, laughing and giggling and all that. And then at the end, the lady sort of said, so what impact has the loss of Sonny Fly had on you? And he just lost it. He completely changed. He, he was crying and there's snot coming out of his nose. And he was, it, it, you could just – and I was doing it too. And I know that there would have been 20 or th 25 or 30 other guys who were in the squad doing exactly the same. And I go, wow, like this should have happened – back in January, you know, like it's not dealing with it. It's just almost putting Sonny at rest and being able to go, you know, we're going to do so much and we're going to do it for us in representative of you more so than we're doing this for you and didn't fire a shot really. So I do recall you, I think it was at a stand-up out at Bethel's. Uh, I think it was at Mount Smart. Was it? When you, you, you know exactly where I'm <laughs> going with this. We, you, you, and that endeared you to me, Yeah. again, as, a, as someone that you look up to. Who well, wasn't... I, was, I was embarrassed. Were you? At the time, I was really embarrassed because I, I try and be a strong, um, yeah, a strong individual, particularly for my teammates. And particularly during that time, I thought we needed to have that real strength. But when I look back on it, we probably needed more of probably what happened. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, um, the reporter asked me very much the same question and, uh, it was very, it was almost straight after it had sort of happened and yeah, so I'm trying to be as normal as I can be and then I just lost it. I was blubbering and could hardly talk and yeah, so, um, I don't know, there's no perfect way to deal with things as we were talking about before, but, um, Mate, he was such a beautiful, beautiful soul. So ahead of his time, um, he packed so much into 20, nearly 21 years of his life and impacted on so many people and would have been a huge star in our game with his athletic ability. And I'd spent a lot of time with Sonny because, um, you know, he, he was someone that sort of really looked up looked up to probably to us like me and Rubes and and I loved doing stuff with him because he, he he took it on board straight away you know defensively he was a big beast and I just said if you get yourself a little bit lower and you don't even have to try hard you're gonna empty blokes out and we started working on that and he did actually start to and he, he goes this is so easy bro you know but I'd always rip into him at training like he was really strong in the gym and he'd do like 200 kilo bench presses and I said mate you got to stop doing these Tyrannosaurus Rex bench presses like it's touch titties and then go full length not these little half little Tyrannosaurus <laughs> <laughs> and I say right let's stop doing that let's do full length ones and he couldn't hardly do two then right and I go now let's take some of these off and let's get your real bench press weight right same with chin ups like you'd be doing these little half <laughs> and I said you got to completely release bars and then go and, and little things like that but my, my favourite thing about Sonny was I'd come to training early and all I'd hear is laughing out of the team room. And what he would do, he'd come to training early because he didn't have Wi-Fi at home or internet at home. So he'd come to train and say he could watch all the YouTube stuff. <laughs> yeah. And he would just be sitting in there. He'd be there two hours before training, sitting in there watching YouTube stuff, cracking himself up. But this is a diversity of his impact was there'd be a, a five-year-old to a 95 year old grandma who would absolutely love him in the same way. That's, that was his impact. Um, was there a good yarn about him winning a Warriors karaoke competition? Yeah, so I used to have uh, a night at the 
sort of the start of the year before the first game. So I invite all the players, the staff and their partners or wives. Um, and I'd always have a theme, so it'd be, say, P. So you'd have to dress up something, P, pirate, policeman, whatever. Um, I'm glad you clarified that. That could have got us in a lot of hot water for methamph- methamphetamine use. So it's good that we it's good no, that we no, got there. None of that. None of that. <laughs> so then we so we do that, and then I thought, what else can we do? But with the boys, and you probably know better than anyone, you got to have prizes, otherwise they won't. Yeah. So I um, saw Mister Aparty. Um, he gave me some long longboard skateboards, which the boys thought were pretty cool. So best female, best male dress. They won that, right? And then I thought, let's have a karaoke machine just to add a little bit. So I did that and I thought, if we have that, no one's going to get up and use it. It's going to be a waste. So we'll have a prize for that. So we had an iPad Nano, which back then, whew. So anyway, I let the team know, boys, we're having the night on Saturday night. iPad Nano, for karaoke, best singer, you know, longboard skateboards for best dress, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, Sonny pulls me aside and he goes, bro. I really want that iPad Nano. <laughs> and I said, all you got to do is sing, mate. You sing and you're the best. You get your iPad Nano. Bro, I'm not real good at singing, though. I said, well, you're going to have to do something, mate. <laughs> anyway, on the night, Rubes was absolutely slaying it. He sung about 10 songs. It's all over, right? <laughs> Next thing, <laughs> the music starts and it's Banger Boys. Um Banger bus or whatever it's called. The banger bus is coming. Yeah. You got the one. You got the one, Steve. So anyway, so (laughs) Sonny comes out and we're going, oh, here we go. What's going to happen here? And he starts to sort of not sing because he was miming and it wasn't good. He wasn't even in time. And then all of a sudden, it got to the beady bit. And then he started just doing his chest and wiggling his hips a little bit and then starting undoing a button. And, mate, all the <laughs> wives are just starting to lose it. I'm going, oh, here we go. He was chiseled, eh? Yeah, Absolutely he was chiseled. a beast, man. Yeah. And he was a beast. So then he started undoing the shirt and then he gets his shirt off and he will flick it, I think. Grant Ravelli's missus copped that one on the face and she's like nearly melted on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, he ended up getting down, I think, to his Speedos um, by the end of the song. And, yeah, it was done, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Rube, sorry, cuz. Yeah. <laughs> Sonny's got it. Sonny's got it. And, uh, yeah, it was, oh, mate, it was awesome. That's too good. I, um, I spoke to uh, Tady in the build-up to this and yeah. I sort of asked him a little bit about yeah, and he had some really nice words to say what I'll get to later. But he also mentioned something which caught my interest, which was a clairvoyant. He said there's a clairvoyant in Toowoomba and there's some interesting yarns about what she – you said you, you're both seeing her and she's come up with some interesting – Yeah, a lot of things that actually happened. When I was saying before about the tattoo that I do believe there's something else and I don't know – whether it's the people that are no longer here, help guide you or direct you or whatever. But, yeah, uh, Cara, her name is. And um, she was on a couple of TV shows a few years ago and one of our friends went there and they just sort of said, when I was at the Bulldogs, you should go and see this lady. And so I said, oh, yeah, okay. So I went and saw her. And I remember the first time I went to her and she said to me, "Um, you're going to win a big award. And I was at the Bulldogs at the time and I've gone – I think I was 20, I'm going, there's no big award I'm going to win. Like, I'm not playing regular first grade. Yeah, no worries, that's cool. Um, Another one she was saying about um, Joe was pregnant and we we didn't know that she was. Um, And she actually was. Mm, And and it was, like, obviously in the early stages, but, yeah, it wasn't after that that obviously I got her pregnant. It was like she was pregnant and we didn't know. Um, and then the award I got, I got Clubman of the Year, which I, I don't know why I got Clubman of the Year. Like I was young and, but obviously other people at the club thought I was doing great and that type of thing. So yeah, it sort of got me thinking, wow, like this. And then as we went along and particularly she brought stuff up about Peter Moore, um, and how he still has a big part to play in my life and, um, grandparents, um, great grandparents, people like that, that I was sort of close to that are no longer here, how they are around and just sort of say they're, you know, doing this or helping me with that or, yeah. So I haven't seen her for a couple of years. I'm going to go and actually see her um, next week. So well, it's weird because I'm doing it by Zoom. So I 
I'm not sure how that's going to work. Yeah. Because I said to her, I said, it's hard to see her because of my work and stuff. And her husband who's organising, he's just saying, mate, we just do Zoom now. And Riley's done it and so has Joe. And they were blown away by what she, what she said. Um, and I just don't know how that can connect. Yeah. But he just goes, just give it a go, mate. And if you're not happy with it, that's fine. We'll sort it out. But it, it's no different. You just ask Riley and Joe. So, did, did she pick your ankle injury that eventually finished your career? Uh, or some of your yeah, some of your injuries. She did talk about she did talk about pain, and I, I think at the time I did have some pain, but yeah, it wasn't the pain that I was going to have. Because were you getting injections every couple get, of weeks to yeah, get I was, you through? I was getting a field. local. Yeah, I was getting a local into my heel for two years. Um, so we're talking after Origins, straight into a Warriors game. So yeah, I ended up. Um, it's quite funny. Brendan McCallum was um, with Puma when I was with Puma and he was wearing rugby league boots at training and I needed to wear different because of my heel. Um, so I was wearing cricket shoes and I just got tagged, like, you know, screwing um, tags for training because um, I found it really hard to run after a game. So I wouldn't really do anything until later in the week. Um, or if it was after an origin, I wouldn't train at all until the game. Um, and I'd just take painkillers during the game. And the, and the um, I got a quarter zone before an origin. It was on a Monday. Origin is in Melbourne. My origin was on Wednesday. And they actually did it via MRI. So they went straight into the bursa. And um, that's probably one of the most painful things I've had is a needle straight into the bone of your, of your heel. <laughs> um and couldn't walk after it. I'm thinking, how am I going to play an Origin in two days? But, yeah, within the next day, I couldn't even feel it. It was unbelievable. So I had the operation because um, I decided 2010 was going to be my last year. So I ended in 09, had the operation so I could have a good season, not having to have locals every game. And I could train every day of the week and stuff like that. Really wanted to enjoy my last year. And unfortunately, I got golden staff and uh, ended up having three operations and not playing in 2010, which is a real shame. But when I look back, it was probably the best thing to happen because if I had played that year every game, I might have wanted to play again. But by that being, you can't play, mate. Sort of made it final and I hated it because I hated missing games. But um, it was probably the best for the club and probably the best for me. We'll get to the transition into life afterwards, but injuries seem to be a theme in big matches for you. I think you were ruled out of the grand final in your last season with the Bulldogs. Missed the Rugby League World, World Cup, Cup final. Lost to the Kiwis. And missed the, your last season that you were contracted to play. Like, that's a fucking shitter of a run of luck. It is. I always try and look at the positives on things, and when you look at it, to actually be in a situation like that, to be in a situation to miss a World Cup, to be in a situation to miss a grand final, to be in a situation to miss your 18th season, I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah. If, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> you actually up yourself to think, oh, it ruined my career because I missed out on those opportunities. They would have been magnificent to have had. Just to have been able to be on the field and on that night, on grand final night, last game for the club, blah, blah, blah. Um, same with, you know, the World Cup. My last Origin game, I got in a fight in the last minute of the game. I didn't have a fight on the footy field in my whole career, really. And that, it wasn't me. And I don't blame Brent or, you know, like Brent, Co um, Brett White or, you know, anybody in that. Like at the end of the day, I remember having that call and I'd been punched in the mouth plenty of times in my career and I just copped it and walked away. And that time, for whatever reason, I don't know why, I was probably sick of mm. being that bloke who just got, not picked on, but, you know, you get you cop a punch in the mouth and then, oh, yeah, what are you going to do, mate? I don't know why, but I decided, nah, but yeah, I'm going to stick up for myself. And it didn't end up working out for me. But um, the most disappointment I have about that is that was my last origin moment. Mm. And I played 28 games, but that's the most things that people talk about everyone that i come across almost talk about that moment more than any yeah. in 28 games and um 
like, I'm really sad because that doesn't represent my career. But you know what? Like I learned a big lesson and I'm proud of myself for not having fights yeah. in footy games. And I had one. Um, I call it, it as a pref- professional fight. There was means watching and I'm none from one. <laughs> it was a TKO, but I got TKO. <laughs> um, and I woke up to Kevin Rudd. Um, you know, which people... It's a strange referee. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. no in the dressing room. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was snoring. You were out, so you were out, out. and then the... Yeah, they took me off yeah. and I woke up in the dressing room, which is quite not weird because um, Justin Paul, who picked me up, looked at me and dropped me, he states that I was giving him verbal mm. and that I was playing it up when he picked me up. Like he was basically saying I was going to punch you in the face because you were giving me giving me lip, and then that's why I did what I did. Well, mate, I was snoring. Yeah, and the doctors will vouch that I was snoring. I was as a Queensland, I was in. I remember being incensed at the time, and like Justin Hodges' reaction and the team's reaction, I guess spoke to what you meant to them as a player as well. Because yeah, it was a it was it was another part of disappointment was. We had the chance to win a clean sweep that game and Pet was injured or sick. He didn't play and we didn't have a good camp and I was crook and then played. A couple of the boys um, didn't prepare the way they should have and a couple of them are big names, right? And one of them almost didn't make it onto the field. That's a fucking that shitter of a run of luck. In the, in the, it is. I always try and look at the like positives on things, and when you look good. at it, yeah. to actually so be in a situation like that, that he wasn't going to, to be in a situation to miss a World Cup, to be in a situation to miss a Grand game. Final, to be in a situation to miss your 18th season. Um, but I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah, if, if, if you know what I mean, like you actually up yourself to think. Wake up call to say, oh, it ruined my career. Greatness, but you're only yourselves to blame. Now, New South Wales didn't want to be beaten, and they came with real aggression. So there's no guarantees that if we had a prepared better, we would have won, but we didn't give ourselves a chance that game. And I never got to be a part of a clean sweep. And it ended up being my last series, ended up being my last game. Um, yeah, I suppose it just puts in perspective that when you say literally every opportunity you got on an origin field was a, was a privilege um, and it could have been your last, and it actually was. So I was playing 2010. Thought I'd hopefully get to play three more games in 2010, and I didn't because I didn't play. So, yeah. what what a way to finish my Origin career, you know? Like, not not sort of cool. I'm quite proud that we didn't bring that up after talking about yeah. how everyone else brings it yeah. up. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, I'm no, not no. having a go at it. No, it's part no, of no. My story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but, no, no. But it's it's the thing that yeah. everyone remembers. Yeah, yeah. Everyone remembers, and uh, yeah, I don't know that. It's just disappointing because it, it wasn't my career. Yeah, that no, wasn't how no, I yeah, played, no, I and I was almost, you know, when people say, "Oh, you're one of the toughest," like I wasn't one of the toughest. Like I was always challenged when I was coming through the grades of not being tough enough or aggressive enough, or and like mm-hmm. one of my proudest things was that I don't believe I changed. I was still me, that kid who came through, and I was still able to make it with all of those people back home who didn't think I was because I didn't have this, 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 or this. Now, I'm not being rude or or trying to be a smart ass, but when I heard those remarks, I looked at those people and I go, you don't know what it takes to be an NRL player because you haven't played NRL. So I'm not going to listen to what you're saying because I believe that I can be and I'm going to try to be. If I don't, that's cool. I'll give it my best shot. But I don't need you to basically tell me that I won't be able to make it because I don't think you are credentialed enough to, unless you'd done it, mm. then I'd go, fair enough, like, because you know what it takes. Yeah. Um, and there's people that almost um, boast that they're a big part of me actually making it. Well, they sort of were because of what they kept saying to me. And you don't go to say, I'm going to do that to you because um, I wanted to make it. I didn't want to make it more because they said I won't. But it, it just continues to add to it. And I almost look at those people and sort of go, yeah, well, like you were a big part of me making it, but it's not the one that you thought. Mm. Like they thought, oh, yeah, I, I, had, I rang up 
Peter Moore and I told him about this kid in Toowoomba. No, he didn't. Mm. Well, if you did, he didn't listen because I know when Peter Moore wanted to know about me and it was for completely different reasons. So, yeah, and that's what I feel so really sorry for kids coming through no matter what it is that they're trying to do, where there's people not around them to actually pump their tyres up. You be what you want to be and do the absolute best to, to try and get there. If you don't, that's cool because it's going to give you so many like lessons that are going to help you in other parts of your life. Yeah. You know? There's so – we could spend hours in, in your footy career, but there's stuff I want to get to past yep. it as well. Yep. And and so you finish up at the Warriors in the last season and you're injured and then it's time to hang them up. But you don't leave New Zealand. And I think we've spoke, we, we've heard the reasons why, you know, you stayed. But then you got into the supermarket business. Yep. I'm quite keen to hear about, like, why you got in and why you got out. Yeah, just stumbled across some people who were in it. Um, they spoke to me about, why aren't you doing this? And I sort of said, oh, well, actually, I don't know. Mate, let's go and have a coffee and um, have a chat about it. So I had that had that chat and was really impressed. I'd never thought of anything like that. And then spoke to Brucey, who's my mate here, Bruce Sharrick, and sort of said to him about it. And Brucey goes, yeah, man, I know a fair few of the boys that are doing the whole foodies thing. And, yeah, they love it. You know, why not? The, the chat in, out in the world for the uninitiated, licensed to print money. It's in supermarket industry. <laughs> Fact or fiction? Because um, we've got a mate who's just got into it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Luke Gage Brown. Gage Brown. Shout out. Only Horse hunger. Only hunger. Yeah. yeah, it is, man. But it's, uh, I, he'll be able to tell you, it's not an easy track, which is why, right? It's like being a professional athlete. Like, everyone wants to be it, but not everyone can be. So, psychometric tests, doing two years, packing shells, not getting paid everywhere because you've got to see how the different setups are, uh, meet the different owners, and the owners get to have a say on you as a person and your traits. And so you're, it's almost, you're an advertising little bandwagon road trip going around. Is that right? 100%, mate. You've, you've got to go to other stores and 100%. cut your teeth. That's to get approved as an operator. So wow. you, you, have to, you have to earn the right to be approved to be an operator and then once you're that, then you can then look at stores that are available and then you apply for those stores and then you go through another process. Three people it's narrowed down to and then they're interviewed and then they'll decide, foodstuffs will decide on who the potential new owner will be of that store and then you negotiate with the current owner and you have to come up with a deal on guidelines. There's strict guidelines within that and it's a process, mate. Then you get the store and then black and white, how you perform, we basically like NRL career, how you progress. Was this, were you thinking about this in your last years of what you no. were to do? No, <laughs> no, it, it just, it was random, so random. So I was coaching Mount Amit Grandma first 13 and I, I think I, I went to the local New World and sort of said, hey, I want to give these boys an opportunity that is different. The rugby league program at Mags was rugby league is not seen as um, the high, you know, you're not rugby union, at, it's particularly not, at it's Mags. It's not first 15, not first 11 Mags football. is like royalty, right? Yeah. Um, rugby and then league was a fair way down. They were trained up in the archery field on, the, on, Mount, <laughs> on Mount Albert Hill, right? So, um, so I said to Dale Burton, who was the principal at the time, my wife's into me about coaching and Dale's into me about coaching them. And I go, right, all right, I will. But I go, we, we've got to be allowed to train and play on number one, like the first 15. I said, and I'm going to do New Jersey's and um, I'm going to be doing this and that and blah, blah, blah. Yep. And he's going, yep, 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 all good. So, yep, he did to his word, he did. And I took that on and what I could see was the boys weren't the best behaviours at the school or the best attenders. And I go, right, this is going to be a way to get the kids to come to school every day because they all want to be NRL players. And I go, I'm not going to be a dream buster, but not all you are going to play in the NRL. That's real. Mm. Right? So you've got to have a backup plan. So the only way we're going to do this is to learn what we need to learn to be best prepared for the next stage, right? So I went to the local um, New World and sort of said to him, this is my plan. I've got a footy team. 
I said, I want to get them working to earn opportunities to grow what they're going to receive or yeah. when we do the nationals, we go and stay at a, a camp rather than at home with, you know, the family and whatever situation there and I can be consistent and we're together and all this. So, yep, went to him and he goes, mate, what, what, this is awesome. He goes, yep, I'll do what you want me to do. So what we organised was two boys every Friday, Saturday, Sunday from four o'clock would come to the New World and would collect trolleys and they'd be in their number ones. So they're representing the school and they'd be collecting trolleys. And if they had a good attitude and that type of thing, they'd, they'd have to do the induction to be employed and they'd get offered a job if they showed the right attitude. And six of the boys got offered a job and six of them stayed there for a good period of time working, which is great, right? So it taught them really good lessons about that. The other bit was must attend every day, can't get in trouble. So Satili so Tupanua, who's at the Roosters, Tilly was in our team and he was pretty much going to school one day a week. And the reason it's as simple as this, right? He would get into trouble because he didn't have the right school shoes. So I'd break every individual down and go, okay, what's the challenges we've got? What have we got to work with? So I went and bought him a pair of school shoes. He stopped getting detentions. The reason why he wasn't going to school, because as soon as he'd get there at form class, he'd get a detention. Yeah. So there's my lunchtime gone. I'm not going to school. I don't want to be spending more time in the classroom. He's an active kid, right? So he played one game. It was a trial game against another school. Killed him, brained him. I said, did you like that? He goes, yep, loved it. I said, all right, if you want to play rugby league in this team, all you've got to do is come to school every day, behave yourself, and you'll get to do that, right? So his turnaround was unreal. He's coming to school every day. He stopped playing up in the classroom because he wasn't getting into trouble because of the bad start to the day. And I was getting complaints from teachers because he wasn't being engaged. So I go, mate, you used to complain about <laughs> the guy who wasn't <laughs> yeah. happy. Yeah. And now he's quiet and you're complaining that he's not engaged in your class. This is a guy who wouldn't hand assignments in or do, do, do tests. And straight away he, he got like a C for the first time in his life and then got a B and then there was one thing he got an A in. And he, you could just see this kid completely change. He got so much pride in himself. And so all of these little things I was doing with these boys, oh, I'm trying to think of the guy's name as the owner. He's such a great bloke. He goes, mate, this is amazing. This is what we're about. So then he got me an interview at Foodies after we had the coffee and I went in and I had to sit down with the uh, the gatekeeper and I got through that, that interview and then I had to do the psychometric tests and do the two years. Lucky enough that I was doing ambassadorial stuff, so I had that flexibility and I was getting paid so I could cover not working um, in the stores and then got approved as an operator and put in for Waipu and and got the got the store. Well, I'll, I'll visit there later on. I've just come down from Mungafai today, actually. I'm staying up there for the weekend. Awesome. So we'll You've got to let me to, know. We'll head up to Waipu. Let me know. Tell me, um, has, has that experience ruined supermarket shopping for you now on the other side? No, nah, I love it. You don't go in and, like, go, oh, yeah, they, could be face, they could be facing things up a different way. Science or... of shopping, mate. Yeah, is, is that right? There is. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And foodies are one of the best. So, uh, there's a whole world yep. that we don't know about. Yeah, I bet you still know There's the secret shoppers. handshake and everything. Three shoppers, <laughs> the snake walkers, boundary riders, and fuzzy wuzzies. <laughs> really? Yep. What's the difference? So fuzzy wuzzies are the ones who go in, they know what they want, they go in, get it, and get out. So probably your tradies who are going in for smoko, just no time, get in the store, get me stuff, get out. Um, boundary riders, they'll go and get me milk, yeah, produce, bread, meat, yep, yep. meat. That's me pretty much around the outside of the store, which is where it all is. Yeah. So you've got to do the whole store. Yeah. And then out. It's good. And then snake walkers, um, they'll do every aisle, probably mum, yeah. doing the weekly shop. She'll be there for over an hour. She's doing the whole lot. Yeah. Now, in different stores. Is that you? I'm a snake walker. Yeah. yeah. In different Down stores right. at different times, those shoppers will be in the store predominantly. And so – the science of the shopping is to put different things in different places. Yeah, that winds me up. <laughs> that winds me up. Chocolate bickies like somewhere else. I'm going, why are they here this time? Why is the toothpaste over you there? Came in. 
<laughs> so you can buy them. That's yeah. why. I read some interview. <laughs> so good. It's really good, eh? You did where you talked about um, you'd be like stocking shelves and people would come and say, Pricey, oh, you've fallen on tough times, mate. Oh, what's, yeah, uh, what's going on? Yeah, what the hell are you doing here, bro? <laughs> and your Mount, Al- Mount Albert grandma number one's just stocking, <laughs> stocking shelves. <laughs> nah. No, so yeah, that was when I had the store and I'm just sort of going. So there's a real misconception. So like you sort of see it as printing money, but there's it, it's a like not a trade, but it's a profession. And you look at the people who work in a supermarket, there's butchers and there's bakers and they're they're professionals. But like even I had that philosophy when I was a kid, like everyone who worked at a supermarket is sort of someone that didn't qualify at school or yeah. but it's definitely not the case at all. And that was one of the things as I went through and I did a lot of the internal sort of studying stuff and I really um, encouraged my staff to be doing that sort of stuff as well because it really, they they would grow as individuals and you'd have a 15-year-old young female who's at school and, and spent three years with me and then would be leaving to go to university and completely different kids to when they first started with you. And that's what part of the Four Squares about um, is giving that confidence and you know, being a bit more outgoing and being able to deal with different people and, you know, all that sort of stuff, having responsibilities, you know, being disciplined, being on time, you know, working hard during the whole time, all of that sort of stuff. And, um, yeah, I loved that. I loved it. And it's probably the closest to rugby league that I've ever experienced since playing footy. My, my understanding was once you could get into that game, you're in there for life. But you did four years and then got out. Three. How, three. Yeah, three. How come you left? Uh, I, yeah, I, I just knew we were getting older. Um, obviously our parents are getting older and I, I just didn't want to be away from our parents not having spent real quality time. We're in Sydney 12 years and we're here 13 years, 25 years away from our family. Um, and all the lessons we were talking about before of what New Zealand had taught me is that to be around your family and Joe, um, they're a really close family that um you know joe's family and we had been away for a long time so to have the kids come back just before they left home like jamo went to sydney before we come back so she'd sort of flown the coop but case and rolls came back with us rolly still had a year to go at school case just finished um i thought it'd be really cool good timing to get them back there otherwise we'd be coming back they'd be probably staying or you know um otherwise i would have still been here mate um, I, I don't say this disrespectfully, but I just think of how much energy and focus it takes to run a supermarket. And mine was an A-grade, smaller version of the big picture. Uh, it only gets bigger and bigger as you go up, which I was really looking forward to. But I could see how challenging it was for time with family and, and that type of thing. And I didn't want to challenge that. So I knew that if I took the next step where we're right in it now because there's a lot of money that's involved as well as you're stepping into a new world which is a lot more responsibility and and that type of thing and um yeah i was just a bit concerned about losing especially when the kids were still around you know probably now it, it'd probably be a lot better if i was doing it now yeah so if it was a five years or ten years further down than where i was i'd, I'd still be doing it because it'd just be me and joey and the kids would be doing their thing but, yeah, just timing-wise, I thought, we sort of got to do this now. There was some chat towards the back end of your career that you might be an NRL CEO in waiting yeah. as well. Is that – like, you think you were doing your MBA at the time? Yeah. Is that still something which may be on the horizon one day? Or are you done with, with footy admin? You know what? I'm really confused um, about actually what I want to do. Um, yeah, I did my MBA. Um, I, I love leading people. I love – um, helping people grow and becoming better. Um, rugby league's my passion, so I thought, wouldn't that be a great fit? You know, both worlds. Uh, I did the GM of footy at the Dogs. Uh, it was only for 12 months. I signed a three-year deal, but uh, there was a lot of stuff going on at the time, and uh, I think there was a little bit of fear of me taking roles and uh, all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, um, I probably wasn't prepared as good as I could have been for it. And I suppose when I retired from footy, I probably should have, I was almost hoping or praying for someone to take me under their wing and say, right, this is where you're going to get to. This is where you're going to start. 
and this is what you've got to do between now and then to get to there. Uh, instead, I sort of went back to Aussie, got asked to go on the board of the Bulldogs, did that. Then the opportunity come up as GM of footy. I've always wanted to do that, yet jump in and do it. It's a big job, mate. Um, Bulldogs were a big club. Things weren't going great at the time. Dealing with salary cap, a big turnover of players and all sorts of stuff. A um, bit of fighting going on in the background because of the board. So it was probably wrong time, wrong place and the wrong person. Our CEO, first time he'd been a CEO, first time a GM of footy, first time our chair had been a chair. <laughs> There's a whole lot of firsts. Um, taught me a fair bit. Uh, didn't scare me, but there's a lot of politics and I think I'd have to be better prepared and you've got to have a lot more support. If you don't have the support, you're wasting your time and I've got a lot of respect for the administrators in the game because I know now what goes on um, behind doors and in front of doors and, mate, it's a tough gig. So... Then the coaching side, I never thought I wanted to be a coach, but when I coached Mags, loved it, loved it. Um, then I did some stuff in Sunny Coast a couple of years ago with the under-20s there and really enjoyed it. Um, but again, how do you get into coaching? Like You've got to start, and I need salary <laughs> to survive, and, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do that. So and if I commit to something, I want to be able to really commit to it like I did at Mags. It was almost a full-time job. Like my, my wife used to say, mate, it's not an NRL team, it's a schoolboy team. And I said, yeah, but if we set a standard, like you treat the boys like dogs, I'll act like dogs. You treat the boys with respect and at a standard, there's no excuses. They'll do that. And it was awesome. Got them a fitted mouth guard and skins and we went swimming for recovery and, you know, all this sort of stuff. So it just got the boys to start to think about what professionalism looks like. Transport us to current day. Um, you're a bit confused. You're not really sure what you're doing. You get a call to go on Celebrity Treasure Island. I'm <laughs> assuming a call's out of the blue. Out of the how, blue. How, how long did the Mate, decision it's no make? New Zealand's favourite Aussie coming back, <laughs> coming back for my favourite TV is, show. Is that a yes straight away Zealand? or is it a like, oh, shit, I'll have to think so about it. So that this. was Brucey. So Brucey rings me because Bruce sort of looked after all my off-field stuff when I was in New Zealand. But I did do some stuff for Celebrity Speakers when I was here doing circuits with corporates. And so those guys rang Brucey and said they'd really like to have Steve on Celebrity Treasure Island. And he said, I don't know what you're thinking, whether you want to or not, but I'll leave it with you and you get back to me and let me know. So I rang Joey. I said, what do you reckon? And she goes, well, you're the one who's got to do it. Pause there. Do you even know what the show is before you've agreed to it? <laughs> not really. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, not really. And so tried to look it up and being in Aussie, I can't download the app and all that sort of stuff. Fucking so geo-blocking, eh? Pisses me <laughs> off too. All the, all the <laughs> stuff that was on there was quite short snippets. Yeah. So it didn't really show me exactly what the show was you about. You could adjust. You're on an island yeah. with some people and there's some sort of... It's not Dancing with the Stars, so already I'm, I'm, I'm well, okay. Well, Joe will never let me go on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> she goes, because they all end up... Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so she goes, you're not going on that. Trade, trade inside uh, secrets. Yeah. No, Sorry, back to just back to Celebrity <laughs> Treasure on. Carry on. So, um, yeah, I, and then I've just gone through all the process. I'm going, well, why wouldn't I? What, why wouldn't, what, what would stop me from doing it? Um, yeah, packing my pants. I uh, thought, do I try and learn as much as I can or do I just go in and go, you know what, whatever it is, it is. And let's, so I went with the, the ladder and yeah. I I reckon it was a pretty good way to go in. So literally no no, no idea. And when I start half talking to James and a few of the others, like, mate, they're encyclopedias. Oh, on. really? <laughs> like, yeah. seriously, they love it. Yeah. And I've just gone, oh, maybe I should have learned a little bit about what's going on. But as soon as you get there, you touch down on the island, I'm assuming. Um, no, it's like it was a big lake. island. Oh, yeah, yeah, South South yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on location. Yeah, Take yeah. that on location. Is is gamesmanship Steve Price kicking in? Are you are you all in as soon as you get there? Can I throw one of my random analogies yeah, like on, I normally is it like walking into a new dressing room of new teammates and you've got to size people up and go, Okay, this is the picking order, this is how I can work this, that's how I think I fucking I'm pitching myself to get on the show. All right. But man. is that like so is that what you do? Is fly Brisbane, Queenstown, go to the hotel I'm staying at 
and I'm going for dinner. And at dinner, I'm going to meet people from the game. And the first person to walk into the room, it was a private room, walk in was Tummy. Mm. And I'm going, hey, mate. And he goes, hey, mate. I go, are you here for... Did you know him prior? Not really. Yeah, wow. But I, I had seen him. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I, I'd never spoken to him. And, um, yeah, then we sort of got chatting like this is sort of weird and all that. And then other people started walking in and, um, yeah, then it was like, okay. And so I got told a little bit what was sort of the gist and I had no idea who, uh, who we were up against because two teams, um, yeah, and didn't meet them until – We'd done a challenge and then our challenge was against them. That was the first time we saw. Oh, wow. So it is proper, so like, no, no smoke and, and mirrors. And proper, you walk in and you're going, oh, okay, oh, oh. And they're doing the same to you. 100%. 100%. Amazing. How tight are the NDAs, like, when you leave? Yeah. Like, there was a um, treasure, Don't look at the Liberty, <laughs> treasure Island party last night. What's right? an Does NDA? It, like non-disclosure. Like oh, you, yeah. You can't say who wins, obviously. Does everyone know? I don't know. You don't know? No, I swear I don't know. Fuck, that's so good. Yeah. Wait, we might have given it. No, no. We might have to read it. Because no. that means you didn't win. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> the, what, the what's an NDA was a good one. You can't have it a fucking NBA and not know what an NDA is. No, well, no. Brilliant, so brilliant, brilliant. I'm saying I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, okay. So that's the the yeah. company line. I don't know. Everyone yeah. gets us. I don't I'm know what sure. happens. I don't know. Yeah, yeah very okay. good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. But um, the people that the other people you meet, does it does it become a family? Like, do you develop close enough bonds with them that? Y- well, I didn't know them, and now I do, and yeah, catching up, like last night, it, it was like a reunion. Like it was cool, mm-hmm. and um. Yeah, and mate, strap yourself in because there's stuff that it's it's happening, right? So that's cool when when that's like that that you can catch up and it's very much like footy where there's mate, you're gonna have some battles, man. But yeah, after it, like yeah, we all we all get on well and respect and and it's really cool. Also, it's a place to take you out of your element. I mean, you're saying you're at a place you're not really sure what you're doing and you're confused. I'm sure after this trip to New Zealand, even this little junket and these experiences and that one back then, it just changes your perspective on things a little bit. Does it give you a bit of a shift? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing the show because I know what I went through and and how in my head things were going, but then how it actually is presented. It it can be really different and I'm really looking forward to that because when I did my intrepid journey, it was like that as well. Like did Nepal... Um, and Kathmandu, um, Kingdom Mustang, and I remember all the experiences that I had, but then other people's vision of that story was a little bit different to what mine was, but it was so cool to see it in that light. And that's going to be this as well. Like there's some creative people who are part of this show who are going to have all of this footage that they're going to put together in a way that's going to be absolutely mind blowing and next level that I probably wouldn't have any idea of, Oh my God, I didn't realize that's how I would look or yeah. do you know what I mean? Sound or come across or I didn't know that person was thinking that. Yeah. Or, that's, that's the great question. Or said that or do you know what I mean? Like they're all the things that how, still don't know. So how are you going to watch it in Australia? Uh, unsure yet. Not sure. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. I'll be able to get something, but yeah. that's, yeah, it's something I've sort of said to the guys um, at Warner Brothers and TVNZ is I've had a lot of people reach out to me and say, mate, we want to watch it, like, that are in Australia. And, yeah, because it's a New Zealand thing, it's only here in New Zealand. So, um, yeah, we'll have to all make a trip over and have a, have yeah. a viewing. <laughs> to, we'll just take a cinema and just, <laughs> what, we'll just have a junket, just watch the whole. <laughs> hey, um, I won't keep you much longer. I know you've got a flight to catch soon. There was one more thing that I want to talk about. Shay might have a few bits and pieces, but the New Zealand Order of Merit. Yes. Um, as an Aussie who came over and spent the time you did here, yep. you received that acknowledgement. I understand there's a story that you thought it was a wind-up when you first... Uh, 100%. Before. Got a letter got the royal logo on it the whole bit right and saying what it was yeah so i thought it was the boys just jammed me up (laughs) because there's some real pranksters in every team but um yeah so doing that and so i rung the beehive and just said 
like, I've received this letter. And then she sort of confirmed my details just to make sure it was me. And I said, I just want to know whether this is legit or just someone's, you know, mucking around. And she goes, oh, no, no, it is. Someone's nominated you and it's up to you. You like whether you accept it or not. And I said, oh, absolutely. This is huge. Like, I, I can't believe it. And, and she goes, well, someone is... And I said, but I'm Australian, so how can I... And then she goes, no, you're in the Commonwealth and you, you're living here and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I was blown away. Mum come over, Joe and the kids were there, government house, um, amazing ceremony. And there were some truly incredible people that were... I was very, well, not very embarrassed. I was very proud, but I was sort of embarrassed when you're looking at people who have done so much in a community for 50 or 60 years and I'm a, sort of a blowing Aussie who, who yeah. um, you know, who's been um, rewarded with something very similar to them. So I wear it very proudly on my LinkedIn um, as a, you know, as a, I don't know what you'd call it, as a part of my story. Um, and it's really cool to be able to explain to people what it means um, because so many people do ask, oh, what, what does that mean? And then I tell them and they go, what? So like you're a, like an Order of Australian medal but in New Zealand. I yeah. said, yeah, and they go, how yeah. did you get that? It's, like, it's so impressive. I, I wonder if the clairvoyant um, time stamped her big award. Would she, would she be referring <laughs> yeah, to yeah. this one, That's you know, you 25 go. years in the future? There you go. <laughs> just, there you go. Just on that same Aussie New Zealand tangent, Owen Gutenbill retold a great story of doing the haka at Buckingham Palace the for queen, the Queen, yeah. the late Queen. You were on that tour as playing the Delhi Messenger role, which yes. was the the one Australian that was in that group. In the group. Did you, did you get to do? Did you, you did you partake in that haka as well? I was trying my best. Yes, I was in the haka. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Um, and spoke to the Queen after it. And she pointed out that my huck was a bit different to... Did she really? <laughs> the other boys. <laughs> and then I told her that I was Australian and then she goes, I could tell there was a little bit of a difference. But with that, I'd been out of the Aussie side for a few years. Um, Ricky Stewart called me back into the team. We played in Wellington on the Saturday and that was when Mark Gasnier got knocked out by Steve Maddow. So we won that game pretty easy. I even scored that day. Well, that, that next morning, I had to get on a flight with the Kiwi boys to go to England so I was really weighing up I'd never really done the haka um so I knew I had to do it and I'm thinking well, when am I going to learn it and I didn't think it was appropriate leading into a test match against New Zealand sneaking off to learn the haka with Rubes or whoever Bailey Mack or whoever it was going to be so basically left it until I landed in England with the boys um went to the hotel um, we, we then went and had a quick training session, come back, had a shower, and then we we're on our way to the um, New Zealand embassy to meet with the representative of New Zealand there for a cup of tea um, and then on to Buckingham Palace. And so I'm like the Wiggles, I'm learning. I had 20 minutes to learn the actions, 20 minutes to do the words, 20 <laughs> minutes to put it all together <laughs> and then on the bus doing it and um, even at um, – you know, the embassy, I'm doing it in the background there too. <laughs> and they get to get to uh, Buckingham Palace and amazing to go through those gates. You know, like I've been to the gates outside of them, stand there taking photos, but to actually go through the gates and in behind and you see what's there and then to go into these uh, incredible rooms. Uh, and then for, you know, the Queen and... and um, Prince Philip to come down as well and then introduce themselves to us or us to be introduced to them and sort of split into forwards and backs and the Queen spoke to the backs and and Philip spoke to the um, to the forwards and then swapped around and then we went and did the haka and they've got I think 200 staff in in the in the palace and majority of them nearly all of them are Australians or Kiwis I don't know the Queen had something that she loved having Australians and Kiwis. So they're all on the staircase watching us because they know what's going on as well. And, yeah, then we, we started into it. And Rubes led that one. And after it, he couldn't talk. He couldn't talk for about three days. Um, so we did it in front of the Queen. And then we did it um, at Leeds Station because the All Golds did that 100 years earlier um, at peak hour, so 5 o'clock. <laughs> and in that one, uh, Dave Kidwell led that one. And we're doing come out and we're doing the the slap, you know. And I thought he was, he was going, ah, to start into it. 
but he just gone, ah, and he kept going. And I started into it and Tommy Tupo, Billy, he was beside me and he lost it because I've started and no one else has. Oh, mate. And <laughs> I'm trying to recoup <laughs> and I go back to that and be quiet and he's losing it. We're both in the back. I wouldn't go in the front. That just would not be good. So I'm in the background and trying to regather myself and he's losing it. And, oh, and then we did it before the game. And then we did it after the game because Stace retired again. I think it was for the fourth time <laughs> <laughs> that he retired again. And, um, yeah, so we did it in honour of him. Um, so I got better at it by the fourth time. But certainly, yeah, it probably wasn't – I'm a big cup of tea man and the best cup of tea I've ever had was at Buckingham Palace. Is that right? And I thought it would be the little cup, you know, like Twinings sort of thing. But it was mug. And I, I so dearly wanted one. And I think I think um, Owen talked about some boys became um, new owners of some tea yeah. teaspoons, which I wish I had have got one of those as well. But I really wanted a teacup. I was almost going to ask the Queen if I could, uh, respectfully. But um, yeah, I didn't have the brass monkeys. Good judgment. It's like asking for an, for a signature oh, on a book. Man, and not... I think they know what happens, yeah. but. Yeah, I, I just wanted to be up front and she might have made a joke about it. She might not have, but I just didn't have the balls to, to do it. Yeah, but cool experience. Hey, this has been such an epic chat. Um, I'm going to start to wrap us up. Uh, I was just reflecting on talking about your dad and talking about Sonny and being in the press conference and showing that vulnerability. I think it's really important now. I mean, we have a lot of these conversations on this podcast of men of a certain age who never used to show emotion and now they yep. do. And the way that you talked about your dad on the island with the contestants and you've shared with us today and, and just the, the value in speaking about it when people are going through through t hard times is just as a strong male role model it's just so valuable so thank you yeah it's it is a hard one and I sort of don't blame mum but certainly mum's the emotional one of our family um, and yeah when I'm proud of something or or very honored or something means something to me I do quite easily get emotional um, and it's something that's always bugged me. I've always tried to um, be in more control of that, but um, I haven't been able to. And I'm actually surprised that I didn't lose it in this, to be honest. Um, the last couple of times I've spoken about that, I've actually been able to, to hold it together a bit. So, yeah, maybe I'm getting more mature or maybe, um, yeah, I'm just proud to be talking about it rather than, really upset to talk about it because of not that you blame yourself but whether you could have done anything else I think I've actually grasped the fact that none of us could have done anything else it was his decision and he's his own man and uh, something I regret every day but at the end of it there's so many things that happen in our life that you can never change um, and you learn from it you know so I learn from signals I reckon if I do speak to people to be very honest and upfront and be not afraid to ask those questions of being there to support because, you know, sometimes that's all it can take. I know my mum one day ran into a lady she hadn't seen for a long time, gave her a big hug and a kiss, said to her how great it was to see her and that afternoon she got a, um, a bouquet of flowers sent to her house from that lady and she said, I was in the darkest place I've ever been in my life and running into you changed that and it just re it reset me on what life and what my life's about and it, having such beautiful friends like yourself, thank you. Like mum was losing it, you know. Yeah. But you just don't know what people are going through and at different times. So, um, yeah, whether people have the courage to ever tell you that or not, but sometimes that's all it can take. You're so right. Um, you don't know what people are going through, and but your your sunny disposition in life and and the way that you've become a leader in pretty much every environment you've entered into is just so inspiring. Like it's so it's been so cool chatting to you. I'm just going to finish with before I throw to Shay with what Tady said. I asked him what makes um, Steve so special. He said 
He's one of the most giving blokes you'll ever meet in your life. He's such a giving person. He's always helped others. He gets a kick out of it. That's the way he captained the club that he's played for and the reason he was skipper for so long. He genuinely cares about them. You won't find a better bloke. No. And after talking to you today, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty clear, but I'll throw it a shave for the big outro. Mate, you, you talk about um, the courage to say things you didn't want to say. I fucking didn't want to tell you that I had your photo on my wall at 29, 30 years of age. <laughs> but one of the reasons I did was for that vulnerability and that ability to show emotion during a time where emotion was needed. And like I've listened to you, sat here and listened to you and, and as a, a son, as a father, as a husband, as a brother-in-law, as an uncle, I'm sure you're doing amazing things. As a boss, as someone who looks to lift other people up, it's incredible. There's been so many um, lessons and takeaways from this episode that I think are going to resonate with a whole cross-section of, of people. Um, it's wonderful to have you back in Aotearoa, New Zealand, even for a short space of time. I'm sure people are going to fall in love with our favourite Aussie again um, on Celebrity Treasure Island, and we hope the whole family gets back here sometime soon to enjoy the araha that we have for Stephen Price and uh, and the kids. Thank you, mate. It's, um, it's truly humbling when... Yeah, here, even with what you were saying, you know, to have an impact on people's lives when you're just a normal person having fun doing what you do. And um, it's really cool. So thank you for sharing that with me. And, and thanks for having me on your program. Like, um, yeah, it was really cool to get a message from you guys to follow you. And I, I did. And, and I've loved watching, you know, your, the stuff that you're doing. So well done. Cheers, Steve.